with that nice introduction, I'm anxious to hear what I have to say myself. <laughs> Actually, the, the nicest, the best introduction I ever had was one time when I was speaking in Wisconsin, and nobody knew me, so I had to introduce myself. <laughs> now, either you folks are really prompt, or the clock is wrong back there. But if that clock is right, I have two hours to <laughs> preach. Because it's 20 to 7. <laughs> but, but I promise I'll be done in time so you can go home and watch the kickoff uh, with the Browns today, because I'm sure that you'll want to do that. Um, I'm intrigued by church signs, and I so appreciate our sign out front here. What an opportunity for ministry, of all the cars that go by, and hundreds of cars, and they can receive something of life. So uh, I want to encourage those who are responsible for that to really pray and, and know what the Spirit of God would have you to say to our community. One of the signs that I saw one time that I wish I would have had in front of our church when I was pastoring, and it said, our church is like fudge, <laughs> sweet with a few nuts. <laughs> well, anyhow, um, I'm going to be talking about spiritual gifts today, understanding spiritual gifts. And that's a long subject to cover. So we're just going to be kind of doing an overview, flying over and uh, looking at the gifts. And then um, there's one set of gifts that I'll be talking about uh, in a Sunday school setting later on. So when I talk to people, I, I'm very interested in their gifts. So when I engage in conversation, I like to ask people, what are your gifts? Um, do you know what your gifts are? There's natural gifts, obviously, and there are spiritual gifts. Do you know what they are? Um, or what about your skills? What are your skills? What are you good at? Um, what's your passion? What's your passion in life? It's good for people to identify those things. So I challenge you, that's your homework, think about that. What are your gifts? What are your skills? What are your passions? And I want to say to the golden agers here that you should never stop using your gifts or stop dreaming. And the other question that I like to ask people, what, what is your dream? What do you want to accomplish? Some people don't have a dream. I feel sorry for them because life is made up of dreams. If you don't have a dream, what do you have? If you don't have a dream, you lose hope. So you golden agers, I want to encourage you. Uh, keep on using your gifts. Keep on dreaming. If your dreams have come, all come true, or maybe some of them have it and you've kind of given up, uh, get a dream for your, one of your kids or your grandkids and pray that dream through. But I thank the Lord for how that golden agers have a place in this church to function. Because in this society, youth is worshiped. And sometimes in churches, the golden agers are kind of just, you know, put out to pasture. But I'm glad that's not here uh, in this church. So anyhow, I want to talk about uh, the gifts. There are three major gifts listed in the New Testament. And again, we're just going to do an overview. And uh, uh, because it's just, I mean, it's a, it's a long study to really dig into it. So I want to start with, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians uh, 12. And I'm using the uh, New King James Version this morning. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. This is what Paul says about spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. 
I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. And then he evidently is referring to the gifts that he's going to be talking about uh, just a few verses down from there. And we'll come back to this because that's the first group that we're going to just go over this morning. But then in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Paul says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Desire spiritual gifts. Unless there's a hunger that you have for gifts, we'll never operate in them or develop a sensitivity to the spirit within us. So unless we hunger for the gifts, obviously our hunger is for God. But to hunger for God means that we hunger for the things that he has already given to us. He wants us to flow in. So unless we desire the spiritual gifts, they're really not operate that well in our lives. So uh, let's look at the first group here. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, let's start with verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The manifestation of the Spirit. So the purpose for these nine gifts that we're going to just briefly look at is so the Holy Spirit can manifest himself through us. That's what he wants to do. He wants to manifest himself through us in these, uh, in these gifts. And there's profit, profit for all. So when we operate in spiritual gifts, it profits people. I used to, well, let me read these, uh, finish reading these, verse, verses 8 through 10. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Now I used to, years ago, I just ignored that scripture because I didn't understand it very well. Do you ever do that? You read certain scriptures you just don't understand, or maybe you don't like even yet, because I don't understand that. So you just ignore that. It's not the ones you put on your refrigerator. <laughs> and so that's what I, I just kind of ignore them. So I don't know. I don't know about some of that stuff. But then as I began to get understanding and study and heard teaching on it, I began to see the value of these gifts. I mean, this is something the Holy Spirit has given to us. These are gifts from the Holy Spirit. And so I thought, well, why should I not at least look at it? And why do I not, why it not uh, study these gifts and, and allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants, if he wants to give us these, these gifts? You see, in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament was the age of the Father, God the Father. When Jesus came to the earth for 33 and a half years, it was the age of the Son. And uh, Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit. He was so excited about sending the Spirit. Once he went back to heaven, he was going to send the Holy Spirit. He was so excited about that and all that the Spirit was going to do through us and for us. And so now we live in the age of the Spirit. This is the age of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, don't we? Thank God for that. I, since that what clock isn't working, I'd better... But my watcher. You know what it means when a preacher looks at his watch? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I found that, you know, there's things in the, in the Bible I don't understand. There's some things I don't understand. And um, there's some things I don't understand about these gifts either. I, you know, I have a lot to learn. I know a little bit. But I've decided that I'm not going to let the things that I don't understand in Scripture stop me from using and flowing into things I do understand. Because sometimes it just kind of stops us. And so we don't want to do that. Uh, so 
I began to change my theology as I studied these, these scriptures, these gifts here. And when it comes to theology, Jesus is good theology. If you want to know what God is like, study Jesus, the words that he spoke, the life that he lived, the things that he, that he, he did. That's really good theology. And by the way, most of our theology, I think, is developed through our experiences. And so we need the word of God to really develop our theology. So I began to see the, the began to desire the gifts, these gifts, saw the value in them. And the Holy Spirit began to manifest himself through these gifts. And I thought, well, this is pretty cool. These gifts are real and the Holy Spirit is real. And so uh, it was a journey. We're still on that, the journey, of course. The journey never ends. So these gifts here, this group of gifts, this is the first one we're going to look at. These are supernatural. These are supernatural gifts, and they're directed by the Holy Spirit. So I can't just say, okay, today I'm going to go do some miracles. I'm going to go do a miracle. Well, it doesn't work that way. These gifts only operate as the Holy Spirit leads us. Somebody say, well, which is the best gift? Which of these is the best gift? The one that's needed at that time is the best gift. And so we just make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit and let him use us in situations where he wants to do something and demonstrate his, his power. So these gifts are supernatural. They're not, the, they're not natural gifts. Uh, we need the supernatural. I think the church, the body of Christ, has lacked the supernatural to some degree. And sometimes people are kind of afraid of the supernatural, but, you know, we have a supernatural God. We have a supernatural devil. And there are people who are bound by supernatural powers. And so we need supernatural power to help release freedom, or to help release these people into freedom. And, you know, the, the world is such a crazy world today, the things that are taking place, and supernatural powers are in existence. We need supernatural power. We need the Holy Spirit like never before, I think, the way this world is going. You were born with a desire for supernatural. The Bible says that eternity is in our hearts. And so there is that desire, and you can see it manifested today. Um, so many psychics, you can go online and contact a psychic, drive down the road, and you'll see a sign for a psychic palm reader. There's a hunger for the supernatural. They're just hungering for the wrong things. They're looking for life in dead places. And so we have, we have within us this, this desire, this hunger for the supernatural. In uh, 1 Corinthians 4, I'll just read this, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20, uh, it says, for Paul is saying, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. I think in America, we would say, the kingdom of God is not in power, but in word. There's a lot of word. There's a lot of good teaching. There's no end to good teaching and preaching. But we don't see the power of God. Like in other countries, for example, I've been to other countries, and, and it seems like it's easier in, in other countries to see the power of God manifested. So uh, we need God's power. In 1 Corinthians uh, verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says this, In my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul said, My ministry is not in the wisdom of what I say, but it's in demonstration of the, the power, the de in demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. He wanted to demonstrate the power of God. We need more demonstration of God's power in our lives, don't we? I think we all desire that. 
in Hebrews 2, uh, you can turn there if you want, or I'll just read it. Hebrews 2, verse 4, Paul says this, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. And in Romans chapter 15, verses 18 through 19, and uh, this is uh, from the New Living Translation. I like the way that it phrases it, it here. And this is what Paul said. This, is, this was his MO. This is how he operated. So is it right for me to be enthusiastic? And this is uh, verse 17 of Romans 15. Is it right for me to be enthusiastic about all Christ Jesus has done through, my, through me in my service to God? I dare not boast of anything else. I have brought the Gentiles to God, Gentiles meaning unbelievers, the heathen, by my message and by the way I lived before them. So by the things that he said, by his words and by his lifestyle, this is how we really preach to people, isn't it? People see how we live, they see how we talk, they see how we react to situations. I have won them over by the miracles done through me as signs from God, all by the power of God's Spirit. In this way, I have fully presented the good news of Christ all the way from Jerusalem clear over into Ilricum. So he said he won them over by the miracles and by the power of God. And in this way, he fully presented the gospel. So the gospel is not just in word, but it's also in demonstration of the Spirit of God, of the power of God. And we need more of that today. And that's why I think one reason why people leave the church, because they don't find anything there. And of course, sometimes they're not looking, they're not looking for Jesus, but... We need Jesus, that's the main thing. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need supernatural uh, power in our lives so that we can be more effective in bringing the kingdom of God to those around us. A church without the Holy Spirit power can do little to bring transformation and change. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit here in this church and for the way the Holy Spirit is working here. But you know what? There's more. There's always more. You never arrive personally or as a church in a place where you feel like, okay, now I've arrived. Glory to God. I've arrived. I've made it. I'm going to park right here. No, we never park, do we? Because it can get uncomfortable. God has a way of, of making things uncomfortable so that we begin to continue on in seeking the Lord and following him. But there is a, there is a, a hunger for, for the supernatural. I was invited to be part of the uh, Paranormal Society in Canton. They had a chapter over there. There's a state uh, society. Met this lady and uh, was invited to the meeting. And the, the lady in charge over there, I think she was a Christian. She said she was. And there was such a hunger in these people to investigate paranormal situations. They were going to homes and buildings and look for spirits and things like that and they had cameras and I mean they used natural things to try to discern um, you know the supernatural activity and I just said well we have, we have the Holy Spirit you know I don't need the cameras I, we can just go in there with the Holy Spirit and we can clean house pretty good <laughs> well I didn't get invited back very often <laughs> so uh, you know, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We used to do, uh, thinking about that reminded me when I was pastoring, if somebody in the church uh, moved to another house, we would go in and do what we called a house cleansing, and I'm sure you guys have done the same thing. Uh, do a house cleansing and just get rid of anything evil, any evil presence, and invite the sweet presence of Jesus to come into every room of the house. So one time this one couple one family, they bought a house, and the junior high gal could not stay in her room. Her room, she said, was just, there was just something wrong. She couldn't sleep there. 
She didn't want to play in there. She told her mother, she said, there's something about this room. I can't, I just can't go there. I can't, I can't be there. And her mom said, oh, it's just in your head. I'll show you. And she went to sleep there that night. She couldn't sleep. She had to get up and get out. And so she realized, okay, there's something crazy going on here. So we came in and did a cleansing, walked through the house, commanded anything evil, because things that have been done there can give right to evil, an evil presence, demonic powers to continue there. And so we just commanded all evil forces to go, invited the presence of Jesus. And it's all very simple, really. Just invite Jesus, his presence. That night, that gal went in there, slept like a baby, played in the room all day the next day. And so uh, I have other stories to tell about, about uh, cleansing a house, some crazy things that happen, people that aren't saved, and what they wanted me to come and cleanse their house because they said, there's a ghost in here. And uh, there was an evil spirit in that house, but anyway, I won't go into that. I want to take time for that. But we've all seen the flaky stuff, right? Some of the stuff you, know, you see on TV and, and, and some things that are just kind of flaky. But I want to tell you, there's a genuine. There's a genuine. And um, the, the devil, well, I'll get ahead of myself here. There's the genuine power of the Holy Spirit. And I remember one time when I was pastoring, I was up on stage, I could tell you, right at the point where I was standing, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, I'm going to do miracles through you in a quiet way. It was very real. That's kind of my nature. I'm not a shouting preacher and, uh, you know, um, that's just kind of my nature, although I can get excited, especially when I beat somebody playing basketball. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, it was after that that God began to work in me in, in new ways. I just said, okay, Lord, whatever you want to do. And, uh, and so that's kind of been the way that I operate. Um, I found out that you don't have to hype up anything. You don't have to hype up the Holy Spirit to get the Holy Spirit to move. Um, I love to just, in a quiet way, pray for people so they know it's the power of God. It's not anything, you know, anything but God's power. And so I've, I've seen God do some amazing things with the quiet little prayer. And I've seen God actually do miracles without even praying, just the laying on of hands, because it's a demonstration of the power of God. It's kind of like, Elijah, remember the story of Elijah? The 400 prophets of Baal. Elijah had this sacrifice prepared and water poured on and everything. And they were testing to see whose God is the most powerful. Baal or Elijah's God? Prophets, they, they did their thing. They danced and they shouted and they cut themselves and did all kinds of things to try to get the fire to come, Baal to send the fire. Nothing happened. Elijah just stood there and said, well, maybe you're God. Maybe you went to the bathroom or something. <laughs> and so Elijah just did his usual thing, evening sacrifice, prayed. Power of God came, boom, and fire ate up everything, and even the lapped up all the water and the stones, the power of God. And so if you have the real thing, if you have the Holy Spirit, you don't have to hype up anything. I don't like hype anyhow. If it's not real, I don't want it. And that was one of the prayers I prayed at the beginning. God, I want the real thing. If it's not real, I don't want it. And so God is very real, and his spirit is real, and his power is real. So uh, there are nine gifts of the spirit here in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, nine gifts of the spirit. It's interesting, there's also nine fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5, right? 5, 22, 23. The gifts, these supernatural gifts demonstrate the power of God. The fruits of the Spirit demonstrate the character of God. We need both. I've heard some people say, well, yeah, but the gifts are, man, these gifts, that's what's important. I've heard other people say, man, it's the fruit. We need the fruit. We need the character. You know what? We need both. We need both. So, the, the, uh, the power of God helps us to do the work of ministry. The power of God helps us to do what we're supposed to do. But the character of God helps us. If we have his character, it helps us across the finish line. If you don't have character, you won't make it to the finish line. 
I've seen, and we've all heard of powerful ministries, very effective, amazing ministries, and they failed, either had moral failure or some kind of failure, and they didn't make it to the finish line. You think, how sad. Paul said in Acts 20, 24, the last part of the verse, he made this statement, and this is a kind of a life verse for me. He said, speaking to the elders, he said, that I may finish my course with joy. That I may finish my course with joy. We all want to get to that point where we can say that. So my question was, how did he know he was finished? Well, he knew what he was supposed to do. If you don't know what you're supposed to do, how do you know if you're finished? So he knew what he was supposed to do. He knew he was finished, and he finished with joy. So I decided, Lord, that's what I want to do. I want to know what you want me to do for sure, and I want to finish with joy. So it's the character that gets you across the finish line, but you need the power of God to do the work that God has called you to do. So Paul said, I, then I may finish my course with joy. I think Paul might have been a golfer. I think he might have played golf because he finished his course with joy. Now, I think, he was a, I think he was a good golfer because you don't walk off the golf course with joy if you're not a good golfer. Isn't that right, Harold? Now, Harold's a good golfer, by the way. So... Um, but uh, but I, I like golf. It's, it's a very relaxing sport. Because I love to be out there because, see, it's holy ground, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's holy ground. It is. Okay. All right, moving along. Uh, I'm only going to just uh, talk about the first three uh, gifts here briefly, then we're going to move on. The first gift here, verse 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom. Notice it doesn't say just wisdom uh, through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, not just knowledge. To another, faith by the same Spirit. So uh, sometimes I've heard this taught as uh, uh, wisdom being a gift, and wisdom can be a gift. Knowledge is not a gift. Knowledge is something you learn. It's not a gift. This says a word, of no, a word of wisdom and word of knowledge. So a word of wisdom is when God gives you something, all of a sudden uh, the Holy Spirit gives you some understanding of a situation that has to do with the future. It has to do with making a decision. Word of knowledge has to do with God giving you something, some information that you didn't learn for somebody or a group that has to do with the present or the past. And that word of knowledge, all of a sudden it just comes, and, and I'm sure you've all experienced it. I just didn't identify it right away. But as you begin to uh, identify how the Spirit works, you can realize, wow, that's the Spirit of God working through me. I love when the Holy Spirit gives a word of knowledge because they know He's going to do something. And... Uh, just a couple examples. Um, some years back, seven, eight years ago, some of my Amish clients, I'm a health, health, uh, health and wellness coach, and so some of my Amish clients said, would you go to Indiana with us and do a meeting for us out here? I said, yeah, I'll go. So we went, we were driving out there, having a good time on the way out, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit dropped a word of knowledge in my heart. And all he said was a broken arm in a cast. Now, see, God doesn't have to say a whole lot of words. When he says something, you, you just kind of get it, you know? So I knew with that. I knew I was going to meet somebody with a broken arm in a cast, and God was going to heal him because it was so clear. And uh, so I'm not excited about people breaking their arms, but... I'm excited about when God's going to do something. So we get out there, we do the meeting in a, in a young Amish couple's home, and I was kind of disappointed. There was nobody there with a broken arm and a cast. And so I thought, well, God, did I miss it? And, and we were staying overnight. And then so the, the couple said there, the guy said, well, he said, you know, I invited more people tonight, but not everybody showed up. 
And I invited my neighbor across the street, Amish lady across the street, but she has a broken arm and a cast. Okay, I got to go there. I got to go see her. So then I stayed overnight. Next day at uh, lunchtime, I went over, and she was there sitting with her family. Her husband was not there. And there she was, her arm on the table, and she had one of those casts that you could take off. And it was laying there. Very friendly lady. Her name was Vera. So we talked a bit, and I said, Vera, what happened to your arm? She said, I had a bicycle accident. I fell, broke my arm. And I said, well, can I pray for it? And she said, yeah, sure. And so I, I went over. I just prayed a simple prayer. Tears come down her cheeks because the pain left her. And then she did this. This kind of freaked me out. <laughs> she had her arm flat on the table. And then she goes and lifted her arm up. God instantly healed it. No pain, no broken arm. And then more tears. Then she said, could you pray for my knee? I banged up my knee, too. <laughs> so I said, sure, I prayed for her knee. She said, no, I'll test it, because when I get on the floor, my knee on the floor, then it's excruciating. She got down on the floor, no pain, got up, more tears. Then she said, I need to tell you something. She said, this morning, I was so discouraged, so discouraged the way life was going, and I prayed, I said, God, if you still love me, can you show me today in some way that you still love me? And that brought tears to me. Then I said, I need to tell you something, Vera. On the way out here, God spoke to me. He said I was to pray for someone with a broken arm and a cast. And I thought, the meeting was incidental. God goes to great lengths to show his love. And so that was as a result of a word of knowledge. So I thought, how many times have I missed it? How many times has, has the Holy Spirit given me a word of knowledge for somebody to, it doesn't always have to be a, a, a miracle like that, but it can be a word of encouragement. Somebody may just need a word of encouragement. Put it on your heart, maybe a scripture, something that you can share with them. And we just kind of dismiss it. And we learn how to do it, you know. God gives us plenty of times to fail, so we learn how to do it. So I love to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. And, uh, and do those things. Another time, I don't know if this is exactly a word of knowledge or not, but um, this is probably back, oh, 15 years ago. There was a, a couple in the church that I had done their uh, uh, wedding ceremony, and they were, they were doing quite well for a while, and then they c fell away. Something happened, and they, we just couldn't reach them, and they separated, went back into the world and drugs and alcohol and things like that. And so I hadn't, I hadn't seen this guy, Tony, nobody knows who he is, Tony, uh, for several years. So one night, I'm sitting in my office, working late. I never worked till 2 o'clock in the morning, but I was catching up on some things. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God said, call Tony. And I thought, Tony, oh my goodness, I haven't talked to him for a couple of years. God, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. What if he's in bed? And I'm, you know, you, you, you say all these things. And I thought, I don't know if I even have his number. So I looked up, and there was a number. And back then, it was, you had more landlines than cell phones. And there was a landline number. And I thought, well, that might not be his number. What if I call somebody else and wake him up at 2 o'clock in the morning? And I thought, well, at least I'm not in his proximity. He can't punch me in the nose or anything. <laughs> so, so I said, OK, OK, God, I'll, I'll call. <laughs> and I, I called. And sure enough, he answered the phone. I said, hey, Tony, what's happening? Man, I felt like I was supposed to call you. What's going on? He said, I just walked in from the kitchen to the bedroom with my 38. He said, I had it right here when the phone rang. And I prayed with him. And he was touched deeply that God saw his need. What if I'd have missed it? And then the amazing thing was, he said, you know what's so crazy about this, Pastor? He said, my phone's been shut off. I don't have phone service. You talk about supernatural. See, God wants to use us in supernatural ways. 
if we're willing to listen, willing to follow him and take those risks, we can change the world around us if we do this. So anyhow, uh, I need to move on here because I still only have an hour and a half left. <laughs> but uh, it's interesting that the third gift is the gift of faith. Now, that's not the faith that grows organically from hearing scripture and testimonies, but it's a gift of faith. There's sometimes when you believe in God for something and you just feel like, man, I just don't have faith. And God gives the gift of faith that you can believe for it. And it's interesting that it's right after the word of knowledge. So that when he gives you a word of knowledge, with it comes the faith to believe for that. Just like with that lady in Indiana. I just knew. I knew that I knew that God was going to heal somebody with, with a broken, uh, broken arm. So uh, these nine gifts here are broken down into three different groups. There are three groups. There are th uh, three gifts that are revelation gifts, three gifts that are inspiration or vocal gifts. There are three that are power gifts. So, class, your homework assignment is to figure out which is which, those three gifts. Revelation, vocal gifts, and power gifts. So you, you can do that if you want to. Okay, moving along, the second group of gifts that we're just going to look at briefly is found in Ephesians. Ephesians 4, and again, these are these three groups that we're looking at are the, uh, the main three groups of gifts in the Bible. So Ephesians 4, uh, 10 and 11. Well, verse 7 says, let's look at verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So this is interesting. These are the gifts that Jesus gives. In 1 Corinthians 12, those are gifts of the Holy Spirit. These, are, these next five gifts are gifts that Jesus gives. Verse 10, it says, He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. We call them sometimes referred to as the five-fold ministry gifts. What for? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. See, these five ministry gifts in the church are designed to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Sometimes churches... We kind of get it backwards. Church says, all right, pastor, we hired you. You do the preaching. You get the people saved. You make us happy, and we'll show up on Sundays and pay our tithe. Well, it's not, that's not the way it's supposed to work. The five-fold ministry gifts, these five ministries are to equip all of us so that we can do the work of ministry. The, the pastors are to lead. The church is to be doing the ministry. That's the way it's supposed to work, okay? So just to give you a quick example of how they work with the illustration of the hand. The apostle, now the apostle, they're not like the 12 apostles, the original. That was the original 12 apostles. But I believe that there are apostles today. I believe they're prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers today. The, apo the apostle is like the thumb. The, the thumb can touch all the other fingers, the only finger that can touch all the rest. The thumb, uh, well, the, 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 the apostles, like the Apostle Paul, for example, he was a tremendous preacher, church planner, raised up leaders, uh, did miracles. He, he could do all those things, right? That's, that's the apostle. The, the second finger, the prophet, is the one that can point. Say, you know, I think God is saying, yada, yada, this is what we're to do, and so forth. That's, that's the prophet. They have a... Um, just a special gift to hear from God, it seems like. The evangelist is the longest finger, speaks of outreach, getting people saved, going into various places. The, the uh, smaller finger there, the ring finger, that's the pastor, you know, marrying people and relationships and all that. That's the pastor. 
By the way, you know what one of the jobs of the pastor is? He's to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> That's their job, <laughs> right? <laughs> the little finger is the teacher. Uh, the teacher helps you to understand the word. The teacher can help you to understand what you know. Sometimes we know things, but we don't understand it. The teacher has that ability to do that. This five-fold teacher can do that. And so the teacher also helps. If you hear a false teaching, you use the little finger to get in your ear, get the bug, any bug out of your ear, right? So the little finger, the teacher, can help you keep the bugs of false teaching out. The little finger also helps you to get a grip on the Word of God. Did you ever try to swing, guys, a sledgehammer without your little pinky? You can't do it very well. It's amazing what that little finger can do to, to grip something, or a tennis racket, or anything like that, a hammer. You try to grip it without your little finger, and you can't hardly do it. So the teacher helps you to get a grip on the Word of God. So those five ministry gifts help to equip us so that we can do uh, the work of the ministry. And these gifts, I think, are office. These are office gifts. These are gifts that, you, that you're born with. And there's probably about maybe 10% of the church that actually are five-fold ministry. So some of you are what we call that, that, that anointing to help really equip, equip the church. Okay, so finishing up, the last group, and, and this group is found in, in uh, Romans 12. If you want to turn there, Romans 12. This is the third group of gifts, and I'm just going to touch on it a little bit, and then we're going to close. Uh, but this, these uh, gifts right here, these are personality gifts. And I'm going to be doing a Sunday school class uh, in two weeks, not next Sunday, starting in, in two weeks on the 22nd. We'll do three or four Sundays, and we're going to go through those, those gifts. So this morning is just a teaser, if you will, and you can sign up for it if you want. And there'll be instruction in the bulletin next Sunday of how to sign up. And you'll need to sign up so we know how many handouts to make, because there's, there's going to be handouts. And at the end, you're going to be doing this evaluation, and you'll know what your gift is, what your personality gift is. It's a very interesting study. So uh, these are called personality or motivational gifts. And let's read Romans, or, yeah, Romans 12, uh, verse, verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, this is not the gift of prophecy he's talking about, although the personality gift of prophecy can prophesy, but uh, we're talking about personality gifts. Uh, verse 7, or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who walks, or he who uh, leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So, there are seven, seven personality gifts. Now, lest you think I'm that smart, I figured all this out, how the characteristics of these seven personality gifts I have not. I've learned some things through the study, but there have been hundreds and hundreds of surveys done and talking to people they began to see a pattern with these, with these personality gifts. And uh, the counterfeit, the counterfeit of these personality gifts would be astrology, astrology, uh, signs of the zodiac. See, the devil can't create. Did you know that? The devil can't create. All he can do is, is counterfeit. And so that's what the counterfeit is. But the real thing is, Seven different personalities. And it's amazing, once you understand them, you'll see them in other people. 
and it will help you to understand yourself better and what your gift is and what motivates you that's different from other people, and it'll help you to understand other people better, why they do the things that they do. So uh, these seven gifts are, I'm going to rename a few of them. So it's prophecy, the personality of prophecy. We're going to call it call ministry. We're going to call that serving. Teaching, exhortation, giving would be, we're going to call that contributor. Leads, the person who leads, administration, and then mercy. So we have different motivations, different pastors, uh, passions. We see things differently. What makes one person laugh makes another person cry. Uh, so there are, these, there are these differences. But it really has helped me to understand myself better and why I do the things that I do because my gift, my personality gift is exhorter. And what I would do before I understood this, uh, I was real free to uh, just to give advice to somebody, you know, in conversation. And I'd offer advice to them, give them some wisdom. And I would do that. And afterwards, I'd think, why did I do that for? I didn't ask for that. And I felt kind of guilty about it until I found out, discovered what my gift is. That's how the, the exhorter works. So some of you are exhorters in here, and you've done that. Um, it's helped me in, in pastoring, especially in marriage counseling, and in, in, in counseling just in general. Because these gifts, when you see them in a marriage, are very interesting. See, opposites attract. Opposites attract. And so when you have these gifts and you understand the dynamics of these gifts, it'll help you with your marriage. And so uh, it really has help, helped us. It has helped me to understand Helen better because Helen is very structured. I'm spontaneous. She's structured. And it helped me to understand why she does certain things. She's goal-oriented. She, her gift is administration. So administrators are goal-oriented, and when they go to do something, don't disturb them. <laughs> Leave them alone. Because they're, they're focused on getting done what they set out to do. Now, all of these gifts have biblical personalities. We're going we're to go over these. For example, administration wonderful example would be Nehemiah. Nehemiah. By the way, you know who the shortest man in the Bible was? Nehemiah. <laughs> but, but anyhow, Nehemiah was an administrator. And so you can study his life. You see how, how he did things, and you find a pattern. And so I'll give you just the first one, and we're, we're, uh, we're getting re ready to land the plane here. I'm just about done here. The first one, prophecy. The prophecy personality is this. They're black and white, no gray area, no compromise. Everything is good or bad. Very little tolerance for sin, sometimes pushy. They can discern motives in people sometimes. They're blunt, direct. How many of you are married to a prophecy? Can I see your hand? <laughs> Okay, maybe you're just afraid to raise your hand. But um, how many of you are a prophecy? How many of you that fits your description? You're kind of like that. Okay, well, you know who you are. Um, but my brother, my brother Les, was a prophecy personnel. That's how he was, black and white. I mean, not much patience. And they're usually hard on themselves, too, the prophecy personality. And you know what's crazy? they attract the opposite gift, which is mercy. Mercy is just the opposite. And his wife, Rebecca, was so kind and sweet and merciful. And, you know, Les, is, he's strong and, you know, not much um, tolerance for, for sin and things like that. So I have a brother-in-law, same way. He's prophecy. His wife is just the sweetest little thing. They're just so opposite. They attract each other. And so, they, so if you don't understand the dynamics of those gifts, it can be a challenge, especially if the husband is a mercy and wife is prophecy. That can create some problems. We'll go over all that stuff in the class. So let me close with giving you an example of these seven gifts coming together. Your car battery died. Battery died. Here comes these seven gifts. 
walking down the road. They come over to your car. And this is how they would respond to it. They all respond differently. Mercy, the mercy personality, would say, oh, I'm sorry, so sorry. Lay your head on my shoulder, you know. I'll pray for you. And they will comfort you. S serving gift comes along and says, he just gets this car and takes you where you need to go. He's going to serve. The teacher comes along and the hood's raised there, and he kind of analyzes the situation as well. Your battery cables are corroded. No wonder it didn't start. Uh, so he analyzes and maybe gives you some options. Contributor, they're the givers, comes along and says, hey, I know where to get a good deal on batteries. Because the contributors, they know where the deals are. They love to give. And believe me, if you want to get a good deal, ask a contributor. The administrator comes along and says, well, I'll just call Joe, and Joe will come, and he'll help you take care of it, because he's, he's a delegator. They delegate. Prophecy comes along and says, oh, there must be sin in your life. <laughs> so <laughs> you see, they all have a different approach. And so that's why these personality gifts are so important. So the purpose of these, closing, in closing, the purpose of these gifts are to discover your gift, Understand what motivates you and others and brings unity into the body and makes you aware of your need for others. So, like I say, we'll be doing that study. We'll start the Sunday school in two weeks from today. And uh, if you have questions, you know, we'll have time for questions, but you'll know when we're done that, with that study, you'll know what your gift is. God bless you.